31. Okay, so here we begin. This is lecture 31. Okay. All right. So, so we've been seeing uh, uh, linear equalizers and decision feedback, decision feedback equalizers, with no constraint on implementation complexity in the sense that no constraint on number of taps. Okay, and no constraint and no concerns about being AR anti causal So you can approximate it and, and do that. That's the kind of thing we've been doing. And uh, so, so some some lessons were hopefully learned from there as to, as to how the receiver structure should look, right? Should have a precursor filter, and then a, then the slicer. There should be a feedback loop around the slicer. Should be a post-cursor equalizer in the slicer. You kind of assume that the slicer decisions are accurate in the design of your filters. Okay, and the design for criteria there are two two types of criteria. One is the zero forcing criteria, the other is the mean square error criteria. And we found the mean square error criteria to be uniformly better than the corresponding zero forcing criteria. Okay, so in fact the like we've been always saying, the minimum mean square error DFE, right? And uh, a certain version of that minimum mean, mean square error DFE, which I'll call the unbiased DFE, has been shown to be capacity approaching for some some uh, ranges. So so it, so there's something canonically good about the MMSC DFE structure. Okay. So I'm going to talk now briefly about this mean square error and probability of error, particularly for the mean square error DFE. Uh, equalizer structure. Okay, so I've been always making this point that just because you minimize mean square error, if your noise is non-Gaussian, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily minimizing probability of error. Okay, so mean square error makes perfect sense optimally only for Gaussian, purely Gaussian noise. Okay, so when you expect some symbols to be a part of your noise, just because you have lower mean square error does not necessarily mean you might have <coughs> low probability of error. Okay, so so you'll see what the MSE DFE does in its quest to minimize mean square error, it will do something which is not very optimal in terms of probability of error. First thing I want to do is to show you that, and then suggest a correction for that, and then we will just leave it at that. I won't do it very rigorously, it's just a, just a notion of why it works. Okay, So let's begin with this. So this title is basically called Unbiased MMSC DFE. Okay. So let's look once again at this model, SK going through H of Z, then noise gets added. Okay, I'm going to say the PSD of noise is SN, which factors is gamma square MN, MN star. Okay, and then you obtain ZK, right? And the uh, for the MMSE DFE, the optimal MMSE DFE, the precursor equalizer will work out to ES by gamma Z squared, right, H star MN inverse divided by MZ star. Okay, so this was the structure and uh, these corresponding quantities, well, SZ factors as gamma Z squared MZ mz star okay and then what is this es es is expected value of mod sk squared okay so those are the various definitions and then you have the post cursor part which consists of a slicer and a feedback loop around it and the post cursor equalizer works out to mz mn inverse minus 1 So S hat k, I'm going to say this is approximately S k, okay. And uh, I'll call this guy at the input of the slicer as X k, okay. So this is this is just the structure, and uh, so hopefully people saw the assignment that was posted. It was posted on Friday, I think. Okay, so hopefully people saw that. It's got a whole bunch of problems on finding what the precursor equalizer is, postcursor equalizer is for simple single pole, single zero systems. And I think maybe even two zeros is there. Okay, so just to get a feel for how it will work out when the positions of the poles and zeros change and all that. Okay, so that's a good thing to work out. Hopefully you get some intuition from that. Okay. 
All right, so so let's see. So before I proceed with the unbiased MMSC, I want to ask a few questions about some characteristics of these filters. Okay, so look at the precursor filter. Okay, what can you say about its impulse response? Okay, in terms of causality, two-sidedness, one-sidedness, what can you say? Making some canonical assumptions about H. Okay, for instance, H won't have any poles outside the unit circle, right? So if you make such assumptions. What can you say about the impulse response of the precursor? So, so suppose it's white noise. Okay, so M n inverse doesn't exist. Forget about M n inverse. Okay, it's not there. What can you say about the? See, H star of one by Z star is going to have Z terms, right? So only Z terms will be in the numerator. What about M Z star? Once again, just Z terms. So if you now expand it out and do the do the partial fraction expansion, so you'll, you'll see it will become IIR anticausal. Okay, so it will be it will be one-sided in the sense that on the anticausal side it will go off to infinity. On the causal side it will stop after a while. Do you see that? Okay, so stop after a while. Okay, and if you do M n inverse, what happens? M n you expect to be causal, right? So so in general, the precursor is going to roughly look like a lot of both both sided. Okay, that's the main story. Okay, so it's going to be two sided. It's not going to be single sided. Definitely not. Okay. What about the post cursor? The precursor is going to be two sided. And what about the post cursor? Yeah, it's, you can expect it to be causal. For instance, if you say M n inverse is not there, noise is white, then clearly it will be strictly causal in the sense that the first term won't be there. Right? M of z minus one. It will go away. Okay, even if M M N inverse is there, it will go away. Right? So it's, it's the first term will not be there. Okay, so it's strictly anti uh, strictly causal in that sense. Okay, so these these are nice things to keep keep in mind. So when we go to constraint complexity and we want to limit the taps, you should limit it suitably. You shouldn't say my precursor will will not have a two-sided response, for instance. Okay, so how will you implement a two-sided response in practice? You delay. Okay, as long as it's finite, you delay and then adjust for the delay in the later sections. You can do it. So that's the thing to keep in mind. Anyway, so that's that comment. Okay. The thing I want to do is try to get an expression for the slicer error. Okay, what is the slicer error? Okay, I'll call it E prime k, which is xk minus sk. Okay, so this is the slicer error. What is the assumption I've already made once I say slicer error? Is S yeah, S hat is approximately s. Okay, so I've made that assumption. Just to make my analysis simpler, if you don't make that, it just will go round and round with some nonlinear processing. You'll never get to a quick answer. Okay, to get a nice feel for it, I'm going to say S hat is approximately SK. So the slicer error becomes XK minus SK. Okay. So now let's write XK. Okay. So remember, XK has is a difference of two signals. Okay. One signal is what's coming from the channel, and the other is from the feedback. Okay. So you have to account for both. So so if you write that very carefully, you'll see this will become. How do I write it? Okay, so xk now I'm going to expand. I'm going to say it is sk convolved with did you get that right? Seem to be okay. So, 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 I should be careful here. I should be careful here. See, I want to say xk is the okay. So, let me be careful. So, xk, xk will have a noise component as well as a signal component, right? So, 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 I don't want to be worried about the noise component, okay? So, I'm going to say, let me let me write down what xk is. So, 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 let me erase this part. This is not xk. Let me be careful, okay? So, let me do that. I'm going to say xk is sk convolved with hk convolved with the impulse response of the precursor equalizer. Okay, so I'll call it h pre k. Okay, the precursor equalizer. Okay, minus what? Sk convolved with the impulse response of the post cursor equalizer. Okay. Okay. So this is the signal component at the input of the slicer okay so i'm going to subtract this 
So from this, I'm going to subtract x s k to get the slicer symbol component error. Okay, so I'm not worried about the noise now. There will be a noise term. It will just add to this. I'm not worried about the noise. So uh, this error e, e prime k is just the slicer symbol error. As in the ISI. Okay, ISI at the slicer. Not there's no noise. Okay. So of course there's a minus s k with tags along here. Is that clear? So this e prime k is does not include noise, only the ISI part. Okay, just for simplicity in the computation. Okay. So of course I can now combine the two negative terms. Okay, let me just do that real quick. Hk convolved with H pre k. We'll we'll quickly move to the frequency domain. It'll become easier, but before that I just want to make sure I get the right part in. Okay, Sk convolved with. How do you bring that in? You have to say H post k plus what? Delta k, right? That's how you bring in that constant term. Okay. So now let's move to the frequency domain. You do transforms, your favorite transform, DTFT or Z transform. You'll get E prime to be equal to, okay, okay, capital S. So capital S is the transform of SK. Okay. So I'm going to call that capital S. Okay. Times what? H times Okay, the pre-equalizer, pre precursor equalizer, the precursor equalizer, the response I've been calling D times W, right? Okay, so D was something D times W, just to be consistent, I'm doing that. Minus, okay, the postcursor equalizer plus delta. So it will be simply W. Okay, so you go in and substitute it, you will get E prime by S to be, to be H times Okay, so I'll do the substitution. You can go back and verify this. This is quite simple. Gamma z square h star divided by m z star. It's just the same substitution that I had before, m n inverse. So this is the precursor equalizer, right? So this is the channel. This is the channel. This is the precursor. From this, I have to subtract the postcursor plus one, okay, which becomes m z m n inverse. Okay. So, so what do we want to do now? Okay. So, so the next thing to do is to look at this term. What is this? E s times mod h square. So you can relate this to s z, right? S z is what s z is what e s times mod h square plus s n. Okay. So you make that substitution in, play around with it, do some cancellations. Finally, you will get this very, very interesting expression, which becomes minus gamma n squared by gamma z squared m n star divided by m z star. Okay. So, you can play around with this. It's very simple. It's not too difficult to do this. This is E prime by capital S. Remember, what is capital S? Z transform with Z k. S k, I'm sorry. Okay, and E prime, okay, once again, capital E prime is Z transform with E prime K, which is the symbol component error in the slicer error. Okay, so, all right, okay, yeah, I'm going to come to it slowly. That's, I'm going to subtract that, I'll get that. Okay, so now if you move back, so first thing is, what type of a filter is this? m n star divided by m z star. Okay, So it might have a lot of components, we don't care about it, but what will be the z power 0 term? Okay, It will be 1. Okay, So you can you can see that. So it will be monic. Okay, So this will be monic filter divided by monic filter. So this is going to be monic. Okay, So that's crucial. Okay, So the z power 0 term is going to be monic. Okay, so that's the only thing we'll use. We won't care about the other terms. Okay, so z power zero term is one, so it's monic. So now if you go back to the time domain, you can write E prime k as a lot of other terms plus what will be the multiplying factor for SK? Minus gamma n squared by gamma z squared times SK. Right? 
So all the other terms will give you other multiplications, okay? But I don't care about it. But SK will have gamma minus gamma n squared by gamma z squared plus some other terms, okay? So this is what it's going to work out to, okay? So now if you look at the slicer input, okay, it's what e prime k is x k, x k the slicer symbol component minus the slicer output. Now if I want to look at the symbol component at the input of the slicer, I have to add s k to this, okay? So if I add s k to this, I get that my symbol component at slicer input is going to be other terms plus which don't involve sk plus sk minus gamma n squared by gamma z squared times sk plus some other terms which don't involve sk. Okay, so if you look at this carefully, it's going to be scaled by 1 minus gamma n squared by gamma z squared. Okay. All right. So when I slice or when I try to find s hat of k from the symbol component, my s k is not coming through without a bias. I'm multiplying the s k by some some number. Okay, and then I'm slicing this. Okay. Okay. So you you first question to ask is how can so this this has to have a bad effect on the probability of it. Okay, so that's the first that's the first observation. It's kind of loose. I'm not going to make it more rigorous than that. I'm going to say because of this multiplication, probability of error is going to be a little bit uh, little bit affected. Okay, so it won't be as good as slicing just with SK. Okay, all right. So so basically, so the first first question is first point to make is the slicer input is biased about. sk okay so the slicer input you don't have sk plus something you have constant times xk plus something okay and how are you going to slice you are going to assume it's sk and slice so if you slice assuming it's sk then your probability of error will be poorer than assuming that you have a multipli multiplication factor and then you slice okay so you have to adjust your received constellation accordingly before you slice okay but remember only if you slice according to the original constellation, you get minimum mean square error. If you do this adjustment in the slicer, then your s hat will change and you don't get necessarily minimum mean square error anymore. Okay? Yeah, because noise will also get multiplied by a suitable thing and you will get you will get into trouble. Okay? So so while mean square error is a good quantity, it doesn't necessarily give you the lowest probability of error. In fact, if you adjust for this bias in your receiver, before you slice, you will get a lower probability of error than the MMSE DFE. Okay? But your mean square error will be larger. But because while your symbol component is also being adjusted, your noise is also getting adjusted. So you have to be very careful about how the trade-off is going. If you just simplify, minimize your mean square error, you might get something which is not necessarily optimal with respect to noise. Okay? Well, the trade-off, I'm not doing an exact analysis first of all, sir. So roughly, so what sh what you should do? So okay, so let me repeat what you should do. Okay, so so this is so basically, the MMSE DFE is biased. Okay, that is the first observation. Okay, so it's a good idea to unbias it before you slice. Okay, so an unbiased version would be something like this. Okay, so you have, uh, so you have SK coming in. H of Z, you add noise to it, then you have the same precursor as before, okay, so I will call it the MMSE precursor, no change there, but before you slice, you multiply by gamma Z squared by gamma Z squared minus gamma N squared, okay, and then you slice. This is the same as adjusting your slicer also, you know, I mean, it's the same thing, whether you multiply before or you adjust the slicer suitably, you get the same thing. And then you feed back with the same MMSE post cursor, no problem there, okay. Oh, sorry, <laughs> feedback goes to the plus and not to the multiplication.
you do this okay you can verify for various examples if you want and even in other cases that such a structure will give you a lower probability of symbol error than the mmse dfe okay it's likely to give and you can see the intuition for why it would give you a lower probability of error because you're slicing properly you're not doing slicing according to some other constellation because you multiplied by something right however if you compute the mean square error in this version you will get a larger mean square error than the mmse dfe of course you have to right the mmse was defined by minimizing the mean square error okay so this is an important lesson to learn when you minimize mean square error blindly okay when you when your error terms have non gaussian components and you just generally minimizing mean square error you are never guaranteed naturally to get a minimum probability of symbol error also okay so th th these kind of things are called unbiased dfes okay so if you learn an area called estimation detection theory unbiased estimators are a very important class of estimators to see okay so the expected value of the estimator should be equal to the expected value before if there is a scaling term then you don't necessarily have a good one good estimator in certain sense okay so all these things are interesting things to learn and uh, unbiased estimators are always good to have so the dfe that we had before is a biased estimator it's not an unbiased estimator so when you go to the unbiased estimator things might improve and they tend to improve naturally okay so you can show out of all the unbiased estimators you have for such a channel this estimator is the lowest msc unbiased estimator you can show that also okay so this is a very good estimator it's got some several canonical structures and you can show canonically its capacity achieving in some sense okay so you can read chapter 8 from barry lee and mr smith to get more idea on this i'm sorry among the unbiased estimators that's the lowest msc if you bias it you might get a lower msc okay so, but that doesn't mean you necessarily gain in terms of probability of symbol error so you have to be so these are all some slightly advanced concepts in estimation theory i don't want to just generally throw it at you but i want to just point out that bias at the estimate of the estimator is an important thing to keep in keep track of particularly when you slice at different points okay so so since i've been mentioning about this mean square error you, sh you shouldn't think that the mean square error is the best thing to do okay so because the calculations seem to tend to imply that you should also keep in mind that mean square error is only a rough indicator of what the actual problem is particularly when the noise is non gaussian when you expect some signal components to be okay so bias is also important okay all right so with this we'll close the close the the unconstrained complexity part we'll move on to the constrained complexity so if you have any questions on any of these things now is a good time to ask did you have a question you seem to be not very happy with this what <laughs> which is better is the unbiased mmse dfe if, if probability of symbol error is what you're looking at right it's better okay any questions so the assignment is already up hopefully some of you saw it there's a whole bunch of practice exercises and uh, do it do it and make sure you stare at the final answer you get for the different situations and try to get some intuition out of it okay so that's that's the point of the assignment it's got lots of questions might sound repetitive to you but don't just do it and forget the answer okay so look at the answer for a while it will give you some ideas okay if your channel has a pole and if your uh, if your noise also has a pole in the same part same point then some interesting things happen if your channel as a zero and the noise also has a zero at the same point some interesting things happen lots of interesting things can happen with respect to noise being non white okay and if noise is white what happens <coughs> when you have a pole in the channel what happens when you have a uh, zero in the channel all that is also important okay so before i close i just want to make a comment about viterbi when you have uh, in the general model okay so how do you run viterbi when you have a pole or something in the channel is a question that's uh it's always complicated so what you do is after the precursor what kind of a channel do you have after the precursor you have a usually you have a causal channel right so look if you think of after the precursor you have a causal channel and it's also minimum phase in the sense that you equalize as minimum phase right so you can approximate that and run a viterbi at that point so so that's a that's a, that's structure is sometimes used so you do a precursor equalizer to get your response to an approximate causal 
finite finite tap version and then run a beta beyond it it's possible to do that also okay so i'm not talking about it because there's no point analyzing that it's just a simulation based thing so that's something you can try after the precursor your response actually becomes causal and minimum phase and nice so you might want to run a beta b there okay so that's something that's done okay all right so we'll stop there and move on to constraint complexity equalizers okay so so we've been seeing a lot of things in this class and i've assumed a lot of background right so i've assumed that you know probability quite well that you know dsp quite well you know the network systems part quite well right i don't know for those of you who are at least following the class or you feel scared of all the terms i'm using must surely know that all these things are being used in this course everything is coming together in this course right the only thing that i'm not using is probably laplace transforms okay, other than that everything else that you have learned it's been extensively used in this course okay so now this constraint complexity equalizers we're going to use one more area which you should have learned by now okay and that is fair amount of linear algebra okay so if you thought everything is not quite coming together there are some things that we learned which are not being used in this course well here is one final missing piece okay so if you're not uh, so some one thing i'm going to urge you to do is I, i'll do it as you as you do, as i as i keep going through the course you'll probably notice a lot of things happening so in are enough of, uh, many of you doing the 515 course math methods nobody's doing it you're doing it okay so if you're doing that then you won't have any trouble but if you've forgotten eigen values eigen vectors what is a uh, positive definite matrix what properties it has all those things it might be a good idea to go take a basic book in linear algebra and quickly refresh okay so i know a lot of people do basic matrices in your high school and for your jee and after that you think linear algebra has nothing else okay and you happily sit back relax and enjoy okay believe me it's way more complicated than that okay so there are some very innocent looking problems in linear algebra which require a lot of theory to be solved okay so and we'll use some part of it here fair amount we'll use but Uh, this is a good opportunity for you to go back and revise linear algebra okay so it's a very useful tool all right so 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 here's how our structure is going to look okay so i'm, I'm going to have sk which is my signal symbol which is going through a channel hc okay once again i'll assume a symbol rate sampled equivalent okay so that's a, so i'm going to have a front end which is like a low pass filter or something and i'm going to sample at symbol rate so equivalently i would have a h of z in the symbol rate world Okay, so that's my model for H of Z. And then I have complex noise. Okay, all these things are complex also. Adding to it. Okay, so I get my input Z K, symbol rate input Z K. Okay, so to this I'm going to apply first a precursor filter C of Z, which is of course going to be a finite type filter because I want to constrain my complexity. Okay, and then I have a slicer. Okay, so all these things are inspired by the previous uh, constructions. okay i have a slicer and then i have a post cursor equalizer okay again finite tap post cursor equalizer okay so hopefully i get an estimate of sk at the output of the slicer okay okay so this is going to be my model i'll call this the precursor equalizer i'll call this the post cursor equalizer okay so if i have if i want to think of a linear equalizer okay what would i do i would set the post cursor to zero okay it doesn't exist d of z would be zero so that would go away okay so both of them both the dfe and the linear equalizer can be nicely modeled with just this one structure okay so if you want a linear equalizer only without a dfe simply make d of z non existent okay so that goes away all right so so again once again inspired by the previous constructions we will select this taps of c of z carefully okay so i'll say c of z has this form Minus L to L, C M, Z power minus M. Okay, so I'm going to pick a two-sided response for C of Z, the precursor, as I expected. Okay, and D of Z I'm going to pick as a strictly causal filter. M equals one to L, D M, C. 
Is that fine? Okay, so that's all I'm going to pick. Oh, I had L for some other notation. No, huh? Really? I thought I always used size X or something. No, size X I took as L. No? Oh, L, number of L. Okay, okay, okay. No, no, no. So maybe I need a different notation for it. I forgot about that. Okay, so SK we said L, right? So this is not L. So I, have to, I need another notation. So what can I use? Capital M. Is that? No, M we've been using all over the place. P. P. Is okay? Okay, so minus P to P. Seems like a safe, safe thing. Sir, I know I can do it. I know I can do that. So L doesn't really make sense. I might as well have L here, but since you objected, we'll have P. P also. also is fine, right? Doesn't make any difference. Okay. 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 So so once again, D of Z will be zero for D of E. Okay. So for L for linear equalizer, I'm sorry, for linear equalizer, and for the D of E, it will be non-zero. So, that's how we'll pick our constraint complexity equalizers. Okay, any questions on the structure? The structure is fine. Okay, so this is how we'll pick. Okay, so now okay. So alright, so I said uh, so we're gonna use linear algebra, of course, right? So uh, so you'll see suddenly things will become vectors and matrices okay so that's the, the whole point in linear algebra right so i don't know if you're familiar with this convolution with the finite type filter can be conveniently represented as a matrix multiplication okay so that's useful and may say various things we'll see as we go along that that's useful so that's the basic trick we'll use to move from signal domain to matrix domain right so we'll represent signals as vectors then convolution as matrix multiplication so that's what i'm going to do next okay so in keeping that in mind the first thing I define is a vector zk, which is a column vector, which goes from zk plus l down to zk down to zk minus l. Okay. Okay, p. <laughs> so now there'll be trouble with me having to replace l with p everywhere. Okay, so remember this is not a constant vector, the vector keeps changing with k, for different k you have a different vector, okay, so how will you modify, what is zk plus 1, push it down and then add the next k in the top, okay, so, so this vector one can imagine is useful for someone who is trying to implement the receiver, okay, if you are trying to actually implement the receiver, you will be getting the zks, after your front end, you will be getting the zks, so you put them in a in a register, which is probably rotating or shifting that way. Okay, and then you process only this vector. Okay, the reason why you process only this vector is the output of the precursor is what? Output of precursor is you write typically zk convolved with ck, right? And then if you write it properly, m equals minus l to l. Cm Z K minus M. So you notice the kth output of the precursor depends on what? Depends on C, of course, on all values of C, but for Z it depends only on Zk. Okay, on this vector Zk. Okay. So in fact, you can write this very conveniently as C transpose zk what would my c transpose be c minus l c0 cl do you agree so c in fact is a column vector okay c transpose is a row vector like this okay so the output of the precursor has this very convenient form. Okay, so that's what the precursor is doing. Okay, so you might have traditionally thought of it as a filter. The filter does nothing but 
multiplication by a row vector, finite type case. Okay, so this is how we implement it. So this is a nice way of visualizing how to implement filters in practice. Okay. So that's see, remember all these things are complex. Every one of these entries are complex in these uh, vectors. Okay, so it's not uh, it's not scalar or it's not real. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do now is first see linear equalizers. Okay, so if I see linear equalizer, then there's no no feedback from the slicer, right? So D doesn't exist. Okay, everything I want to optimize with respect to is with respect to only C. Okay, so I have to pick only C of Z. So I'm going to look at linear equalizers first. And now for linear equalizers, there are several possible criteria. Okay, there, there are two possible criteria that we saw. The first one is the zero forcing criteria. The second one was the mean square error criteria. Okay, the zero forcing criteria is uh, we saw it's not as good as the mean square error criteria typically. So I'll do the mean square error criteria. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so we're going to see this the mean square error. linear equalizer okay so of course the moment i say mean square error you need to worry about the error itself okay so i'm going to define the error okay so let's see let me just draw a picture before we proceed okay i'll call the output of the precursor as x and this is going to go through a slicer there is no no other filtering and you get s hat which uh, which is s hat okay that's fine okay so my error signal is going to be defined as xk minus sk okay so xk i know now can be written as c transpose zk okay well you have a minus sk okay so to move towards the mean square error, we are going to do expectation of mod e k squared. Okay, so now I have to think of everything as random process. Okay, so first of all, S k is going to be a random process. Usually, you assume S k to be the I I D uniform random process over the alphabet X. Okay, so maybe something else is also possible, but we'll assume that to be a random process. Okay, so likewise here, C is going to be a deterministic vector. Okay, so there is no there is no randomness here. This is going to be constant. Zk is going to be what? It's going to be a random process as well, but it's a vector valued random process. Okay, so it's slightly complicated. Okay, so don't think of uh, Zk itself as a random thing, but basically you think of this as a vector from from the random process what zk okay so that's the best way to think about zk the vector zk is basically a vector from the random process zk how do you how do you find zk zk is nothing but sk convolved with hk plus nk okay so assuming i know hk and the statistics of nk i can quite easily find the statistics for zk okay so but i have to know hk if i don't know hk i cannot find the statistics for zk okay so for now when we do the computation we'll assume we know hk and nk so that we can find the statistics of zk so what are the statistics i might be interested in typically you always make the white and stationarity assumption so once you make the white and stationarity assumption out of filtering and computing mean square error the only statistic you'll need are first and second order okay so you'll need mean and autocorrelation but be careful about autocorrelation these are complex valued processes so autocorrelation value is slightly defined slightly differently i'll write it down as we go along okay so i'll assume white sense stationarity in fact jointly white sense stationarity joint white sense stationarity of zk and sk and all that okay so all these things we'll assume sk and k are jointly white sense stationary so that it's meaningful to define autocorrelation and cross correlation etc okay so that's the thing those are the things we'll be interested in okay so let me just quickly write down the expression for the mean square error and then we'll probably stop there. Is the expected value of mod e k squared. Okay, so you're writing it in terms of vectors. So a lot of care is required. Okay, so I'm going to write the conjugate term first. Okay, so look at the first term. The first term is actually a real number, right? It's a product of two vectors, but it's a 
real number so when i conjugate and all that i can be happy there's no problem so i'll write c conjugate transpose zk conjugate minus sk conjugate okay so so notice my notation here star means conjugate transpose means transpose star transpose means what Com conjugate transpose okay so there's all kinds of notations possible here different people use different notation just to emphasize all of that i'm going to put this okay so remember that okay and then i'm going to do c transpose ck minus sk all right so that's the first step we've written the mean square error in terms of these vectors okay so now you see what the modus operandi is going to be okay so you've written the mean square error in terms of c and you know the statistics for everything else so when you pull the expectation inside c will kind of nicely come out and you're going to optimize the mean square error with respect to c and find the best possible c okay, so that's that's the flow here that's what i'm going to do okay so from here on it's just simple plain linear algebra okay there's nothing more to do okay so the intuition is uh, from the from the channel and signal world has given us a nice simple linear algebra, linear algebra problem which we have to solve and find the best possible c okay so but to do that it's, it's it's algebra okay so you have to manipulate play around with the terms see what comes out try to get some more intuition about the problem and then finally try to solve it okay, so that's what we're going to do okay so let's do the first step of simplification okay so the first product that i'm going to write down is the easiest term you can write down expected value of mod sk squared right so that comes from the last the two terms the second terms multiplying okay and then you will have a bunch of cross terms Okay, so I'll come to the cross terms later, but before that, I'll write the other square term. Okay, so what is this? This product C conjugate transpose ZK star multiplied by C transpose ZK. Okay, so when you write product of several matrices, you have to be very careful with brackets. Okay, so you know this is a real number. This is a number scalar. That is a number. So if you put brackets around each of these, you can multiply. But if I want to remove the brackets, I have to be very very careful. Okay. For instance, if I just write all the four matrices together, it may not make much sense. Okay, you have to be careful. Okay, the way you write it. Okay, so you should make sure that things are compatible and you write it nicely so that expressions become easy to evaluate. Okay, so the way to write that very nicely is to pull C star conjugate out, keep the expectation inside, and write Z k star and Z k. transpose okay so remember this term is also equal to zk transpose c okay so the way i write it i do that and then i would get a c out here and then there would be cross terms okay cross terms i'll write in the next page okay there are cross terms which i have not written here yet. all right at least the first two terms are easy to see and the cross terms will come in and we'll simplify i think this is a good point to stop and pick up from here in the next class okay so we'll start simplifying things and proceed from here